Next up, we have Paul Swaddle, who, who is the Chief Exec Officer of Pocket App. Um, he's going to be talking about some of these um, different screens uh, in more detail, specifically tablet and mobile uh, consumption. Um, Paul uh, went into the mobile industry at the height of the internet boom uh, uh, with the Vizavi? Vizavi? Right, whatever. <laughs> uh, you can correct me later. He then um, later helped launch Yahoo Mobile uh, in the UK. Um, and he's worked with brands as diverse as Kellogg's, Fruit Winders, Barclays, and Loaded Magazine to get the best out of mobile. I wonder what their interest was in. Thank you. Um. As said, uh, I'm Paul Swaddle. Uh, I run a multi-platform app development company, um, and I've been in mobile entertainment and content uh, pretty much since it began in the late 90s. Um, and I was asked to share some thoughts on uh, second or dual screen consumption. So first, let's have a look at some numbers. Um, there's lots of stats thrown about uh, second screen interactions, but I thought I'd just like to highlight two. 86% of smartphone users use their devices while watching TV. This was a stat quoted last week, but what it wasn't qualified by was what people were doing with that in that 86%. For example, I use my phone while watching TV with my wife because I don't like the program she's watching, <laughs> not because I'm engaging deeper with that TV content. And the most, the most popular second screen activity uh, actually has nothing to do with TV content itself, but is actually checking one's email, um, uh, and that is, that's the most popular for the couch-bound smartphone user. Uh, the second number relates to the scale of interactions, in fact something that was just talked about. Um, there are, for some social interactions, uh, much, many more than one can possibly consume on the average hashtag. So 10,000 tweets per second during the Super Bowl, well, what, what, how as I as a consumer can I engage with that? So the question moves on from how do I engage, but how does someone manage uh, sculpture or curate those engagements for me to give me something that I can consume. So where did all this audience engagement begin? Well, well before all these newfangled gadgets, it was Blue Peter competitions, it was Vision On Gallery, um, and these were the users were contributing physical contributions. And then we progressed to phone-ins like Swap Shop, and then on to voting, and then to progression of the sort of early second screen applications like Test the Nation, which was talked about last week. But let's look at some of the different types of second, integration, in, second screen interactions today, uh, and perhaps where this might lead. So at its core, You've got voting apps, the core of popular TV interaction, whether it be by phone, by the ubiquitous text message, by application. Um, and this is a default and starting point from which many shows uh, have, have set out. Um, but there's more that can be done, uh, bringing in the backstory, the deeper content, the gossip. But interesting, the research shows that the consumers aren't interacting with that additional content in between shows, which is what people always envisaged, which was this deeper, longer engagement, but rather interacting it during the dead periods in the TV shows. Now, I blame those endless bumpers that tell you at the end of the ads what's coming next and in the beginning of the next session what's coming in the next bit. But that means that people are then distracted and go off and do something more interesting instead. And apparently that's when the user is actually engaged in those deeper pieces. Now, this is my daughter. She's watching The Voice. Um, or rather, she's not watching The Voice, um, and I'm not quite sure that's what the TV show intended to happen. And I think that that, for all second screen, is, the, is one of the issues. Are people going to consume and interact in the way that you imagine or you hope to program? Now, The Voice has another interesting, uh, some other interesting aspects um, because they are inserting second screen content back into the TV show. Uh, a lot of TV programs show a hashtag in overlay. 
but the sweets are seldom shown on the first screen, and when they are, they're not always relevant to what's, going, uh, what's, in, what's happening. So interactive TV is much more than just showing tweets on TV. It's about how do you use that to feedback uh, in, in a live scenario. If you watch The Voice, they use it in the, uh, the V room on the wall uh, and start to interact a little bit. But I think it's only really the start of what is the opportunity to have a much deeper engagement. So then we move on. So we've done voting, and then going beyond that, there's that sort of shout at TV stuff. The, oh, the answer's A, or don't put the money on that. And these quiz shows, like Million Pound Drop and Open the Box, can lead the way from that initial interaction to a monetization that you can then do online. So you might start playing the interactive game to do with the TV show, but then move on to a on fully online uh, gambling or gaming experience where that audience can be monetized. Or win entry to the real show, so that you actually go from game to, to, to a TV show. Um, and Antiques Roadshow will be uh, introducing their Play Along, where we can all do what we've always done when watching Antiques Roadshow, because obviously, actually, I'm real antiques buff. No, we're all watching because we want to know how much it's worth. And so you can have a guess uh, and play along. And this is a, a, a form of gamification. And that can then be taken further in other TV shows. So The Walking Dead has a, a, a very nice app, very simple, very clean. You have opportunity to look at trailers and previous kills. But once you click into the main portion of the app, it very cleverly starts to sync via audio to determine which episode you're watching. It offers you the choice uh, of which human killer and uh, their weapons for that, si that episode, and then a kill count projector. So you can play along with your friends, but it's a quite passive play, so you can enjoy the show, but still have some engagement with the application. Um, it's very stimulating for the, the, the demographic. It's designed to fit that audience. Um, now, all of the examples so far have been examples where it's been done by the content owner. But it doesn't have to be like that. So Star Player was an iOS app for Heineken, launched in 2011, providing a, a second screen experience for football fans, but not distracting from what matters most, which is the match. So the Star Player app allows viewers of Champions League to interact with the, show, with the match in real time, earning points by predicting game events such as goals and corners, and answering questions in pop-up quizzes. And players compete against their friends in mini leagues, and also can uh, rank against other users of the app more generally. Now the amazing stat I liked from this was the dwell time on the app is an average 56 minutes, which for any level of digital engagement is huge. Um, during this year's Super Bowl, uh, Coke created uh, some commercials featuring two animated polar bears. And they extended this into a second screen polar bowl where the two bears, one rooting for the Giants and one rooting for the Patriots, reacted to the game, the halftime show, and the commercials in real time. Now, this is a real, I mean, this I think was a fantastic innovation. It showed that you could really have some fun, but really engage with. OK, not TV audience numbers, but significant numbers. The Bears commented via Twitter, uh, and while they had planned for 300,000 concurrent live streams, more than double that number had the stream open by the end of the third quarter. Um, and it was the interactions on Facebook and Twitter that were driving those streams. Another option is totally independent services. So we have some check-in services like Miso or GetGlue. And these are cool, but they don't really resonate with the content on the first screen, because interaction is far more than just check-ins. So Zbox in the UK uh, is an app that combines social media and mobile commerce, uh, syncing your second screen content. And it's aimed to make TV a more immersive and social experience than ever before. It's Innovations include the ability to serve as a remote control for TVs that are web-connected. 
Uh, and B Sky B, uh, who owns this, is, is prepping a US launch. Now, Yahoo uh, into now, a US uh, application, uh, is dedicated, uh, is, is detecting what you're watching on live TV on 130 channels, and is currently indexed some near 300 years of archived content. And it synchronizes through the audio stream, using the audio for TV in the same way as you would use GPS for Foursquare. And then it was able to serve up contextual stories from Yahoo based on real-time interactions. So, for example, this one is showing uh, watching college football and being able to see the live stats uh, uh, on, your on your tablet. Uh, and then you've got comm more, much more overtly commercial operations, such as Watch with eBay. You can't see this in the UK, but their US application lets shoppers uh, shop in sync with the TV and what's on. Uh, and the idea is it shows up relevant content to the, app, uh, to the show that you're watching. However, eBay's idea of relevant can be quite extremely different from mine, uh, as if you've ever done a search on eBay for any item, you tend to find a, a rather eclectic mix. So what's the future? Well, Apple is looking to release a range of TVs that run on uh, iOS. Uh, and that uh, brings the App Store and iTunes on the big screen. But, but that's not really an, a second screen. That's just a different way of accessing the first from your comfort of your sofa. Um, there are new challenges emerging. Um, the most recent episode of, Games of Game of Thrones, a fairly significant supporting character dies, and I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it. <laughs> but even if you hadn't seen it, simply watching Twitter, you would have had that linear experience ruined. So you're actually being forced back to watching the live first broadcast of linear TV by the social media. Otherwise, you may have it sp that experience spoilt for you. And then I think, where, where could this go? Um, now, London Transport uh, did some very innovative work looking at opening up APIs on data and saying, we won't build the applications. We'll just make the data available and let others come and do something with it. So could TV shows or TV channels make more data available through open APIs so that other people can work out what to do with the content? You know, do you have to control all aspects of it? So now, I was speaking to a TV executive this week, and they said they have enough trouble getting a simple API on scheduling. So I may be dreaming somewhat into the future. But the idea that you could have an API that told you what the adverts were and that affiliate marketeers could go away and use those to make interesting and compelling content that get presented you with offers without the need for either the brand or the TV channel to do any extra work might open up whole new areas of commerce uh, and, in, uh, and possible interaction. You know, could a TV game show make an API available that made its questions and answers available live and let somebody else work out what to do with it and charge them a fee for using the API? So I think there are some interesting challenges ahead in that area. And I'm going to leave you with one last thought, um, and that was my son. And this is a picture of him I took last night. He's playing Minecraft while watching YouTube and texting on his phone. So my final thought is, which screen is the primary and which is the secondary? Will TV drive the social media or will it be the other way around? Thank you.